I thought it would be fun to ask ChatGPT to try and save the Roman Empire. I told an instance of ChatGPT4 that it had to choose a Roman name for itself, a year when it would be born, and under what circumstances. It would then have to try and become the Roman Emperor, with the goal of leading the Empire in a way that ensured it would last far longer than our original timeline. I also created a second instance of ChatGPT, called the Arbiter, who would evaluate the outcome of the first ChatGPT's decisions and simulate this new timeline. ChatGPT decided it would be born in the year 240 AD, under the name Gaius Petronius Turbulentus. Turbulentus would be born in the city of Taraco, located in the province of Hispania Terraconensis. Before continuing, I asked ChatGPT to give more background lore to Petronius Turbulentus' family, so we know his status in Roman society. Here's what it said. The Petroni were a family of equestrian rank, tracing their lineage back to a mix of Roman settlers who had founded the city centuries earlier, and local Iberian nobility who had been integrated into the Roman aristocracy following the Roman conquest of the Iberian Peninsula. The Petroni had long been involved in the administration of Hispania, contributing several magistrates and military officers to Rome's service. The family's wealth was derived from a combination of land holdings, which produced olive oil and wine for export across the empire, and investments in mining operations in the nearby mountains, extracting silver and lead. The family exemplified the Roman ideal of mas maior, the customs of the ancestors, upholding traditions that valued public service, duty to the empire, and personal honor above all. Gaius was born as a second son in a family that valued excellence and service to Rome. From a young age, he showed an uncommon aptitude for both military and philosophical studies, reflecting the dual nature of Roman education that emphasized martial prowess and intellectual development. His father, Lucius Petronius Secundus, a decorated military officer and an educated man, ensured that Gaius received training not only in arms, but also in rhetoric, law, and history. Gaius's upbringing in a family that honored both Roman and Iberian traditions gave him a unique perspective on the empire's diversity, seeing it not as a weakness, but as a source of strength. With the empire's stability waning, Lucius saw the importance of sending Gaius to Rome to further his education and build connections within the political and military elite of the empire. Gaius's journey from Taraco to Rome marked the beginning of his rise, as he leveraged his family's legacy of service and his own talents to carve a path towards the highest echelons of Roman power. In 256 AD, Gaius began his military service in the legions stationed in Gaul, serving under co-emperor Gallienus. This time period is known in Roman history as the Crisis of the 3rd century, a period in which plague, civil war, economic calamity, and barbarian invasions brought the Roman Empire to the brink of collapse. Gaius's early career is marked by rapid advancement due to his leadership qualities and tactical acumen. He serves with distinction in campaigns against the Germanic tribes and the Goths, earning himself a reputation for bravery and strategic insight. Gaius's first battle was in Mediolanum in 259 AD, when Gallienus repelled an invasion by an army of the Germanic Alemanni. Gallienus's efforts to reform the military and stabilize the empire greatly influenced Gaius's views on leadership and military organization. In 260 AD, Gallienus's father and co-emperor, Valerian, was decisively defeated in battle against the Sassanid Empire and taken prisoner. Postumus, the commander of the Rhine legions, takes advantage of the situation to rebel against Gallienus, becoming the leader of a new breakaway state from Rome, the Gallic Empire. All of Gaul, Hispania, and Britannia soon falls under the Gallic Empire's control. In 263, Emperor Gallienus launches a military campaign to retake the breakaway provinces. Gaius Petronius Turbulentus remains loyal to Gallienus and continues to serve in the Roman Emperor's army as it invades Gaul. However, Gallienus was injured in the fighting, and his army retreated from Gaul without accomplishing any of its goals. In the year 268, a group of conspirators assassinated Emperor Gallienus. A man named Claudius then becomes emperor. He was either chosen by the conspirators or selected by Gallienus on the emperor's deathbed. Nevertheless, Gaius chooses to be loyal to Claudius, having risen to the rank of Tribunus Militum in the Roman army. In this role, he commands a unit of cavalry. He reports directly to the emperor's second-in-command and commander of the overall Roman army, a man who would be emperor in the future, Aurelian. In this position, Gaius becomes part of Aurelian's inner circle. He takes on some of Aurelian's political, military, and religious beliefs, such as the worship of the sun deity, Sol Invictus. In 269 AD, the Goths invaded the Roman Empire. Emperor Claudius and the Roman army met the invaders near Nisus. At the Battle of Nisus, Gaius and his unit of cavalry played a pivotal role in disrupting Gothic supply lines and outflanking the Gothic army. After the Battle of Nisus ended in a decisive Roman victory, Emperor Claudius rewarded Gaius with a Coronia Aurea, a gold crown, which was a prestigious military decoration that indicated Gaius's bravery in battle. After Claudius' death in 270, due to illness from the Cyprian Plague, Aurelian becomes Roman Emperor. 
At the same time, another set of Roman provinces break away from Rome to form the Palmyrian Empire, led by Queen Zenobia. Gaius accompanies Aurelian as the emperor musters an army to reconquer the provinces lost to the Palmyrian Empire. Gaius continues to distinguish himself in this campaign, which leads Aurelian to appoint him as Legatus Augusti Pro Praetore, essentially a governor of military authority of the provinces of Dalmatia and Pannonia. This dual role allows Gaius to understand the complexities of imperial governance and the necessity of a strong, disciplined military force. Aurelian goes on to swiftly reconquer the Gallic Empire in the west, being proclaimed Restitutor Orbis, Restorer of the World, for bringing the Roman Empire back from the brink of destruction. He is assassinated in 275, after only five years as emperor. A man named Tacitus was then proclaimed emperor. Under Tacitus, Gaius, as a respected military commander, is tasked with leading campaigns against external threats, particularly in the east. A few months later, Tacitus dies, and his brother Florianus declares himself emperor. At the same time, a man named Probus, who was governor of Egypt and had previously served under Aurelian, declares himself emperor. Gaius decides to support Probus. Gaius and his legions in the east then join up with Probus in Anatolia in order to fight Florianus. Florianus' own troops murder him in September, allowing Probus to become the uncontested ruler of the empire. Probus then appoints Gaius as commander of all Roman forces in the Balkans. While in this position, Gaius leads the Balkan legions into many victories against barbarian incursions and makes several trips to Rome to speak to local politicians. While at Rome, he gives lectures on the need to reform the empire particularly by delegating more power to the Senate and local elites, as well as a need to foster civic engagement in all Roman citizens. These lectures earn him fame and support among the senatorial class. In 282, disgruntled soldiers assassinated Probus, leading to the ascension of Emperor Carus. The new emperor designated his sons Carinus and Numerian as Caesars. Emperor Carus then left Carinus in charge of Rome as he embarked on the campaign against assassinates in the east. Carus experienced significant success in this campaign, reaching as far as Thesophon, before suddenly dying in 283, possibly due to a lightning strike. His sons then become co-emperors. Numerian then marches the legions out of Sassanid territory back into the Roman East, giving up all of his father's military gains. Incensed by this waste, the Balkan legions revolt, proclaiming Gaius Petronius Turbulentus as emperor. Many other military units across the empire declared their support for Gaius. From now on, we will refer to Gaius as Emperor Turbulentus. A group of pro-Turbulentus senators and politicians seize control of Rome in a coup and arrest Carinus, declaring their support for Turbulentus. Turbulentus offers clemency to Carinus if he agrees to back Turbulentus' ascension to the throne and goes into a quiet retirement. Seeing Turbulentus seize control over most of the empire, Numerian's troops assassinate him, giving sole control over the empire to Turbulentus. ChatGBT has now taken control over the Roman Empire. It decides that the most pressing matter to attend to are much-needed economic reforms in order to counter the hyperinflation that permeated the Roman Empire during the crisis of the 3rd century. As part of these reforms, Turbulentus introduces a new currency, the Aurea Novus, composed of gold and silver. Coupled with a series of other monetary reforms, the Aurea Novus successfully stabilizes the Roman economy and the gears of hyperinflation. Furthermore, he sends envoys to the Sassanids and Himyarites, successfully negotiating new trade agreements with the goals of fostering peace and bolstering the economy. He also appoints Diocletian as military governor of the Roman East. In 284, Turbulentus personally leads the imperial army in crushing a major revolt in Gaul, further consolidating his military control over the empire. After this, Emperor Turbulentus embarks on a series of legal and governance reforms. Every city, town, and even village is now governed by an elected assembly, with every free man entitled the right to vote. This has the goal of allowing local decision-making and encouraging citizens to participate in the civic process. These local assemblies appoint delegates to provincial assemblies that deal with broader regional issues. The provincial assemblies have authority over local legislation, infrastructure projects, and public welfare initiatives operating within the framework of imperial law. Provincial governors, all directly appointed by the emperor, would retain significant power, including military command, tax collection, and law enforcement, acting as the emperor's representative. The balance between the assemblies and governors ensures local needs are addressed while maintaining imperial cohesion. At the same time, Turbulentus delegates control over Italia to the Senate and Tribunes of Rome, fulfilling his promise to restore their old powers. The Senate in Rome holds the same powers over Italia that provincial assemblies hold in other provinces. Furthermore, Turbulentus enacts land reform throughout the empire. He seizes land from large wealthy landowners, redistributing them to the plebeians who then run their rural villages as democratic agricultural communes, with local assemblies governing each village. 
In 286, Turbulentus reforms the Empire's judicial system, codifying the Empire's laws in a book called the Code of Turbulentus. Furthermore, he significantly increases the number of judges and local courts across the Empire, while giving every citizen the right to a free and trained legal professional in all legal matters. All judges and lawyers must be educated at newly established Roman law schools. In the same year, the Carassian Revolt emerges under Carassius and Electus in Britain and Northern Gaul. Turbulentus dispatches one of his senior commanders and closest allies, Marcus Aurelius Valerius, with a large army to quell the rebellion. Valerius would spend the next ten years putting down the revolt. In 287 AD, Turbulentus enacted the Edict of Religious Unity and Toleration. As part of this edict, he endorses the cult of Sol Invictus as a state religion, instituting annual games and festivals to celebrate the sun deity. This edict also enshrined freedom of religion as part of imperial law and prohibited any type of religious persecution or discrimination. Imperial support is offered to religious institutions of all kinds in order to promote the values of peace, unity, and loyalty to the empire. Hundreds of statues, temples, and shrines to Sol Invictus are dedicated across the empire. Priests of Sol Invictus are now given state support to travel the empire and collaborate with priests of other gods, seeking to syncretize every possible deity into the Roman pantheon with Sol Invictus as the most important deity. In 289, one of Turbulentus' informants revealed to the Emperor of a plot by Diocletian to overthrow Turbulentus. Turbulentus preempts this by swiftly traveling to the Roman East, with an army at his back. His quick arrival surprises Diocletian, who agrees to a meeting with the Emperor. At this meeting, Turbulentus tells Diocletian that he knows about the plot. The Emperor tells Diocletian he now has two options. He can retire from military life and take up politics in Rome, or he can be executed immediately. Diocletian chooses the first option. News of Turbulentus' clemency spreads throughout the empire, and many see this as a sign of weakness. This leads to a major revolt in the year 291. Quintus Fabius Valens, the military governor of Egypt, feels overlooked by Emperor Turbulentus, and is bitter at the lack of progress in his career. He takes advantage of a power struggle in Egypt's provincial assembly, aligning himself with Egypt's priests in a dispute against the merchant faction. The priests declare Fabius Valens as the pharaoh of Egypt. Pharaoh Valens then declares Egypt's independence from Rome and threatens to cut off all grain shipments to Italia if his independence isn't recognized. Initially, Turbulentus offers amnesty to Valens and his supporters if they back down, but Valens refuses. Turbulentus then dispatches a huge military expedition, led by the military governor of Asia, Sextus Pompeius Festus, to put down the rebellion. Festus gathers 20,000 troops and dozens of warships from the Roman East and heads to Egypt. At the same time, another huge revolt breaks out in Gaul, led by General Lucius Septimius, one of the deputies of Marcus Aurelius Valerius. As Valerius is busy confronting rebel forces in Britain, whispers of the Cyprian Plague's resurgence in Rome find their way to Gaul. These rumors include alarming news of the emperor himself succumbing to a severe bout of the disease, pushing Turbulentus to the brink of death. As the emperor has no clear successor, Lucius Septimius proclaims himself emperor, rallying the legions of Gaul to his side. When it turns out that the rumors of the emperor's sickness were false, Septimius refuses to back down, instead declaring the re-establishment of the Gallic Empire. Turbulentus offers amnesty to Septimius and his supporters, but they refuse. The emperor then mobilizes a huge army, consisting of 40,000 men, to put down the revolt. As the imperial army gathers, Diocletian, who has spent years active in senatorial politics, personally implores the emperor to allow him to join the campaign against Septimius. Diocletian wants to prove his loyalty to Turbulentus and make up for his past treachery. Turbulentus accepts, but appoints Diocletian as Legatus Legionis, putting him in command of only one legion. The campaign against Lucius Septimius is intense and fraught with challenges, as Lucius Septimius proves to be a formidable adversary with significant support. In a pivotal battle near Lugdunum, Diocletian leads a contingent in a daring maneuver intended to turn the tide of the conflict. However, the engagement is more brutal and prolonged than anticipated, and Diocletian is gravely wounded. Despite his injuries, Diocletian's actions significantly contribute to the battle's outcome, leading to a decisive victory for Turbulentus' forces. Lucius Septimius is killed in the fighting, and his army surrenders to Turbulentus, who offers them pardons for resubmitting to imperial authority. Diocletian's injuries prove mortal, and he dies shortly after the battle, his last moments marked by words of loyalty to Turbulentus and the Roman Empire. Turbulentus honors Diocletian as a hero of the empire, and his sacrifice is memorialized in public monuments and the annals of Roman history. Meanwhile, Festus successfully puts down the revolt of Fabius Valens in Egypt. The repeated offers for amnesty led to several more opportunistic revolts in the next decade, but they are put down by Turbulentus, Festus, Valerius, and another one of the emperor's most favored generals, 
Sextus Varinius. In 293, Turbulentus reforms the Empire's public health system, passing an edict that commissions the construction of hospitals and medical schools throughout the Empire, as well as required bathhouses to be built in every urban area, and introduce quarantine measures into imperial law. In 297, the Sassanid king Narsa launches an invasion of the Roman East. Sextus Varinius, together with the nephew of Marcus Aurelius Valerius, a promising young military officer named Lucius Aurelius Commodus, successfully defeats the Sassanids at the Battle of Edessa, then push into Sassanid territory. The war is resolved by 299, with the Sassanids conceding a small amount of territory to Rome. Commodus' exploits in the war win him widespread glory and fame across the empire. Commodus eventually rises to the overall commander of Roman forces in the Roman East, putting down a major revolt in the year 303. By now, Turbulentus is convinced of a need to establish a clear line of imperial succession. In 304, Turbulentus conceives of a new imperial institution, the Concilium Principatis. This council is meant to serve both as an advisory body to the emperor, as well as elect the heir to the empire when called upon. It consists of 16 members, 4 military leaders, 4 senators, 4 provincial governors, and 4 representatives elected from the provincial assemblies. The provincial assemblies are all divided into four respective geographic regions, with each region sending one representative to the concilium after several rounds of voting. The emperor gives himself the power to appoint the other 12 members of the concilium. Furthermore, every single representative to the concilium has to be approved by the senate in Rome. In 305, Turbulentus convenes the first meeting of the concilium Principates, with their agenda being to elect an heir to Turbulentus. With the strong support of Marcus Aurelius Valerius, and the unanimous backing of the Concilium Principates, Lucas Aurelius Commodus, the famed commander in the East, is named Caesar. His selection promises a future where the Empire not only maintains its territorial integrity, but also thrives as a beacon of cultural and societal advancement. As Caesar, Commodus now functions as a junior emperor under Turbulentus, who retains the more senior title of Augustus. In 306, a crisis known as a sectarian discord afflicts the Empire. By this point, Turbulentus had gotten used to decades of relative religious harmony in the Empire. He passed a series of edicts reforming and promoting the cult of Sol Invictus in Rome, codifying worship of Sol Invictus into a book, establishing a huge new temple to the sun god, as well as significantly expanding the priesthood. These sun priests now were encouraged to proselytize and promote the worship of Sol Invictus above all other gods in the pantheon, relegating other religious practices to much more secondary roles. In 306, competing parades between Christians and the sun priests led to a violent clash in the streets of Rome. This led to a series of anti-Christian pogroms by the sun priests and their fundamentalist followers throughout the empire. This religious fervor spilled into the army, with sun priests attempting to ostracize followers of Christianity and Mithraism from the legions. The sun priests made Mithraism into a boogeyman, blaming the secretive cult for many of the Empire's problems, and on several occasions lynched legionaries accused of practicing. Many legionaries were quite fond of Mithraism, and so on several incidents murdered sun priests for chastising the religion. For nearly a year, sectarian violence then gripped the city of Rome. At one point, a legion of Mithraists revolted and burned down the imperial palace, only placated by pay raises and direct negotiations between them and the sun priests, overseen by Emperor Turbulentus himself. In 307, Turbulentus managed to finally end the sectarian discord with his edict of religious representation. Four new seats were added to the Concilium Principatis to represent the followers of Sol Invictus, Christianity, Mithraism, and the traditional Roman pantheon. Furthermore, state funding was poured into all religious institutions across the empire, even those who are not part of the cult of Sol Invictus, in order to get them to support the emperor. Additionally, religious tolerance education was mandated for all civil servants and legionaries. The next decade of Turbulentus' reign was marked by unprecedented prosperity. In 312, an edict is issued encouraging architectural innovation across the empire, leading to the construction of public works that include aqueducts, bridges, and forums. In 314, Turbulentus expands the Concilium Principatis again, giving four more representatives to the provincial assemblies in order to include more diverse perspectives from faraway provinces. In 316, the emperor then leads a decisive campaign in Germania, launches a public education initiative in 318, and in 320 convenes religious, cultural, and political leaders from across the empire to sign the Harmony Accord in Rome. This is a declaration of mutual respect, tolerance, and cooperation. In the year 322 AD, while preparing for a diplomatic mission aimed at securing a lasting peace treaty with the Sasanian Empire, Turbulentus falls gravely ill. The illness strikes suddenly and with such severity that it halts all imperial activities. Despite the best efforts of his physicians, Turbulentus' condition worsens over several days. As Turbulentus lies on his deathbed, he is surrounded by members of the Concilium Principatis, his closest advisors, and his chosen successor, Lucius Aurelius Commodus, whom he had been mentoring for years. 
In his final moments, Turbulentus is said to have offered words of wisdom to Commodus, urging him to lead with justice, wisdom, and compassion, to always seek the unity of the Empire, and to never forget the lessons learned from the sectarian discord. Turbulentus then passes away after 39 years of leading the Roman Empire. His legacy is one that dramatically transforms the history of Western Europe. Most notably, his promotion of local democracy, civic engagement, and peasant control of agricultural communes results in a different economic system taking the place of feudalism in this timeline. This new economic system, which ChatGPT calls Kivitas Contractualism, leads to the development of strong regional identities in the empire. Every citizen now has a stake in their region's survival, and citizen soldiers take up arms to defend their region from foreign invasions in the next century, allowing the empire to repel a series of Germanic and Hunnic invasions. However, an overwhelming number of natural disasters and barbarian invasions in the next two centuries still leads to the decline of imperial authority in the empire. The western provinces feel they can no longer depend on the emperor, now based in Constantinople in the east, and begin relying on each other more often for support rather than the emperor, forming their own regional alliances, which become quasi-states within the empire. These regional alliances raise their own armies that operate independently of the emperor in Constantinople. The Eastern Emperor, beset by financial difficulties and overwhelmed by a new outbreak of bubonic plague and invasions by the Sassanid Empire, loses his ability to enact effective control over the Western provinces. The year 550 marks a turning point in the Roman Empire, as the Britannic Alliance declares independence from the Empire. Emboldened by this, the Danubian League, locked in a dispute with the Emperor over the collection of taxes, also declares independence. The Emperor sends a huge army to retake the lands of the Danubian League, but it's defeated. Over the course of the next several decades, more of the western provinces break away to form their own states, such as the Gallic Commonwealth and the Hispano-Roman Federation. These new states are marked by their democratic nature, with the provincial assemblies each electing representatives to a senate, who then elect a military governor, called the Republican Prefect, to serve for terms of several years. By 590, the fall of the western empire was complete, as the Italian confederation declared independence from the empire, taking North Africa with them. This led to a protracted war in North Africa, resulting in the Roman Empire's defeat by 598. By the year 600, Europe is on the brink of a unique era that diverges significantly from our historical Middle Ages. The legacy of Turbulentus and Kivitas contractualism, with its emphasis on local democracy and communal economic practices, sets the stage for a continent that values civic participation, innovation, and cultural diversity, laying the groundwork for a different path of social and political evolution.